In the cold and isolated landscapes of Colorado, Stephen King's misery unfolds like a chilling and claustrophobic nightmare. A psychological horror novel at its core, misery delves deeply into themes of power, obsession, control, and the fragile, often violent, relationship between creator and consumer. But the story goes beyond just these surface elements, exploring the darker corners of the human psyche, where trauma, addiction, and madness fester in a battle for survival. It begins with Paul Sheldon, a once prolific author whose life has become a suffocating repetition of writing the same series of romance novels featuring a character named Misery Chastig. Tired of this literary prison, Paul kills off Misery in his latest novel, determined to break free and pursue more serious, meaningful writing. At the conclusion of his latest book, a gritty, serious novel called Fast Cars, Paul experiences a moment of liberation. For the first time in years, he feels he can write on his own terms, not pandering to the expectations of his readers. There's an intoxicating sense of freedom in this moment, but it's fleeting. Fate, however, intervenes in a way that shatters his newfound sense of liberation. On his way back from finishing fast cars, Paul drives into a snowstorm. His car spins out of control and crashes. This event, seemingly random and chaotic, represents the abrupt descent of Paul's life into his worst nightmare. It's as if the forces of nature themselves are punishing him for daring to break away from the confines of misery. When he awakens, Paul finds himself bedridden in a strange house, attended to by a woman named Annie Wilkes. Annie Wilkes is a former nurse, and she proudly proclaims herself Paul's number one fan. This seems like a fortunate stroke of luck for Paul at first, as Annie tends to his injuries and assures him that everything will be fine. But King masterfully shifts the tone of the story into a psychological game of cat and mouse, as Paul slowly realizes that Annie's adoration for his work is not the innocent, harmless admiration of a fan, but a dark, twisted form of obsession. She isn't just his fan, she's his captor. The house becomes a kind of prison, with Paul unable to move due to his legs being broken in the crash. But this physical entrapment is only one aspect of his captivity. Mentally and emotionally, Paul is at the mercy of Annie's whims and moods, and here King starts to layer the horror, not in grotesque, violent acts at least not immediately, but in subtle psychological shifts. Annie is kind one moment and cruel the next. Her care turns into control, her smiles into frowns, her affections into something darker. When Annie reads Paul's latest novel, the one in which misery dies, her disappointment and fury erupt like a volcano. She is unable to accept that her beloved character is dead, and this marks the true descent into madness. Annie demands that Paul burn his manuscript of fast cars and start writing a new misery novel, one that brings the character back to life. She tells Paul that he will not leave the house until the book is finished, holding him hostage in the most visceral way imaginable. The very act of writing once Paul's escape from reality now becomes the means of his imprisonment. This shift in the story symbolizes the destructive side of creativity, where the act of creation no longer belongs to the artist, but to the audience. Annie Wilkes is one of Stephen King's most memorable characters, not just because of her outward cruelty, but because of the layers beneath it. On the surface, she's a menacing figure a violent, unstable person who delights in inflicting pain. But beneath that exterior, Annie is a deeply lonely and broken individual. Her obsession with Paul and misery is her attempt to fill the void in her life, to give herself purpose in a world where she feels abandoned and forgotten. Annie's mania is tied to her need for control, but it's also tied to a profound, almost childlike desperation for connection. She is unable to differentiate between fiction and reality because the world of misery is the only place where she feels significant. Paul's experience with Annie is not only a fight for his physical survival, but a battle of wills. He must outthink her, manage her unpredictable behavior, and figure out how to escape. But this is not easy when your captor is both incredibly intelligent and dangerously delusional.
King plays with the idea of the unreliable mind both Paul's and Annie's exploring how pain, trauma, and madness distort reality. For Paul, pain is a constant companion throughout the story. From the physical agony of his broken legs to the mental anguish of being forced to write something he no longer believes in. He is forced to confront his own fears, insecurities, and vulnerabilities, not only as a person, but as a writer. Writing, in misery, becomes a metaphor for survival. Each page Paul writes is another day he lives, another day he keeps Annie at bay. But there's a deeper significance to this act of forced creation. In many ways, Paul's journey mirrors that of any artist who struggles with the demands of their audience, who feels trapped by the expectations placed upon them. Annie, in this sense, represents the worst kind of fans the fan who feels entitled to the creator's work, who believes they have the right to dictate the artist's vision. What happens when a creator loses control of their creation? What happens when the audience begins to dictate the direction of a story? In Paul's case, he is literally imprisoned by his own work. Annie forces him to resurrect misery, to undo the very thing that gave him a sense of liberation. He is forced to betray his artistic integrity in order to survive, a situation that resonates with the idea of commercial versus artistic expression. King, who has often spoken about his own struggles with the expectations of his fans and critics, weaves this tension into the fabric of misery in a way that feels deeply personal and relatable. As Paul writes the new Misery novel, he becomes immersed in the process. At first, he's writing simply to stay alive, but slowly, something shifts within him. He begins to find pleasure in the act of writing again, not because of the content, but because of the process. Writing becomes his lifeline, not just physically but psychologically. It's a testament to the power of creativity even in the darkest, most hopeless circumstances, the act of creating something can be a source of salvation. But there is a sinister twist to this. As Paul writes, he begins to identify with his captor. He starts to understand Annie in ways he never wanted to, recognizing the same obsessive tendencies in himself that drive her madness. There's a disturbing moment of self-awareness where Paul realizes that he, too, has used his characters and stories to control his world, to escape from reality, just as Annie uses misery to escape from hers. This blurring of boundaries between creator and consumer, between artist and audience, is one of the most psychologically rich aspects of misery. Annie's cruelty escalates as the story progresses, culminating in several horrific moments that showcase King's mastery of psychological horror. One of the most infamous scenes involves Annie punishing Paul by hobbling him a brutal act in which she breaks his legs with a sledgehammer to ensure he cannot escape. This scene is not just about the physical violence, but about the psychological domination Annie exerts over Paul. She has total control over him, body and mind, and Paul is left completely at her mercy. The horror here is not just in the act itself but in the realization that Paul's survival is dependent on pleasing someone so volatile and unpredictable. As Paul nears the completion of the new Misery novel, the tension in the story reaches a fever pitch. Every word he writes brings him closer to freedom, but also closer to death, as Annie grows more and more unhinged. She's no longer satisfied with merely keeping Paul alive to finish the book. She wants to control every aspect of his life, including how it ends. There's a terrifying sense of inevitability as Paul plots his escape, knowing that his time is running out and that Annie's madness will eventually consume them both. In the final act, Paul's plan to escape comes to fruition in a climactic confrontation with Annie. After finishing the manuscript, he tricks her into letting her guard down, and in a desperate struggle, he manages to overpower her. Annie's death is brutal, but it's also symbolic the moment where Paul finally regains control of his life and his work. Yet even in death, Annie haunts him, a lingering presence in his mind, a reminder of the horrors he endured. The psychological trauma Paul experiences throughout the story lingers long after his physical wounds have healed. King doesn't offer a clean, happy ending where everything is resolved. Instead, 
Paul is left to grapple with the lasting effects of his captivity. The scars, both physical and mental, will remain with him forever. He may have escaped Annie's clutches, but her influence over him will never truly fade. Misery is more than just a horror novel about a writer held captive by a deranged fan. It's an exploration of the complex, often toxic, relationship between creators and their audiences, between art and commerce, between freedom and control. King examines how easily the line between admiration and obsession can blur, how creativity can be both a source of liberation and imprisonment. Paul Sheldon's story is not just a tale of survival, but a meditation on the power dynamics inherent in storytelling. The sacrifices artists make for their craft and the dangers of losing control over one's own creations. By the end of misery, we're left with a profound sense of unease. Annie Wilkes is dead, but the horrors she represents obsession, control, and madness remain very much alive. In a way, Paul's ordeal is a metaphor for the artistic process itself. Painful, isolating, and fraught with danger, yet also strangely cathartic and necessary. Creativity, King suggests, is both a blessing and a curse, capable of bringing us closer to freedom, but also binding us in ways we can never fully escape.